So we're going to get started with the presentation today. I'm, if you haven't heard in here from my last presentation, I'm Matt Olson with the Wild Air Soil Conservation District, which is Sargent County down in the southeast part of the state. Um, I'll be talking about our high tone we have down there, um, where we started and where we're at today. Just kind of giving a brief update on that. Not so brief, but. So, what is a high tunnel? Here's a picture of, of our high tunnel. Um, basically all it is is just a rigid frame covered with UV plastic that helps plants grow better. Um, I know there's probably not more cool scientific stuff to it than that, but. Um, so this is what ours looks like on the inside most of the time. This is usually about mid-May picture, I would say. Um, you can see all of these lines are our trellis plants. We trellis uh, all our tomatoes, our cucumbers, our peas, and we get pole beans. So we kind of try to alternate those every row just so we don't have trellis everywhere. So we've got a nice little walkway that goes through here. Um, our high tunnel technician is in a wheelchair, so that's why you'll see a lot of people set theirs up a lot different than ours. Ours is just for outreach and education, so uh, we set it up for, to basically meet our needs. And here is a, a cool little time lapse of what goes on in the high tunnel in a given year. Oh, it's going to work. Look at that. What a difference a couple weeks makes. Oh my goodness sakes. So as you can see, that's kind of how it moves through the year. I'm already behind. I haven't done any watering out there. Uh, first step for the year is usually just go up there and basically flood irrigate. Uh, our high tunnel is different than a lot of people's. We've got automated sides. Um, so in the winter time, we pulled the fuse on that. We left the fuse in one year, and those awkward warm summer days, basically it was trying to roll up, it was frozen shut. We, we fried the motor on the side piece, so we are always learning lessons. Like last year when I flooded the office in April. So first, talk about some of the benefits of the high tunnel. Obviously a longer growing season. Um, you know, that's the biggest thing for North Dakota. You can get in there, as you can see, we've got plants in the ground usually that first week in April, maybe that second, we're starting on some of them. Um, harvesting lettuce basically early May time frame. Um, also, we're growing way later in the year, which is cool because that allows us to do some really cool things after our first crop that I'll come to later. Um, able to grow crops from a higher plant hardiness zone. Uh, some of the things that we've done in our high tunnel, we've uh, produced peanuts, okra, some of those more traditionally southern crops. Uh, that allows us, the heat allows us to do that. Um, micro irrigation helps control weeds. Um, usually after we flood irrigate that first month, uh, we get a big flush of weeds throughout. Once we put in that uh, drip irrigation and start watering just that way, uh, those issues pretty well go away. Micro-irrigation also increases water efficiency. Like Tom said, if you're dropping it down, you're wasting the water. The drip tape that just comes up, goes to the side right there, easy to use. Um, and higher productivity of plants for longer periods. Um, it's not all sunshine and, rain sunshine and rainbows. Um, I'm always honest with people. Uh, it, it is a high initial investment cost. Um, of, in talking with people, We've got some apps coming in now for high tunnels, and they're running about about that ten to eleven thousand dollar range for a medium sized high tunnel right now. So obviously not cheap, whereas in North Dakota, everyone 
everyone in the country has land, so they have gardens. Uh, so um, it's high initial investment cost. Um, higher potential for pests. Um, you'll notice that you get a lot of aphids, a lot more of the stuff you don't deal with as much outside, um, short of rabbits. Um, setting it up in a low wind area. North Dakota is god awful for high winds. So uh, we're really lucky in our office. If you take a look back, the trees extend all the way around there. So we are really really lucky where we have that we've had no issue with any of our tops blowing off any of the problems with the sides or nothing uh, one of the more common problems with them is you know that by nature they're usually frequently tilled um, ours is in, in city limits so we're on city water which is generally not the greatest uh, for a garden usually a lot higher in salts Maintenance slash upkeep of high tunnels. Um, there can be some cost. I mean, it's not the plastic. I think the roof on it, our high tunnel's been replaced once since we got the high tunnel. And I think the sides have been done twice and need to be done again this year. Um, lastly, uh, from plant aspect, um, as you've seen, ours has automated sides. Uh, great idea for keeping pests out. Problem is, is it does keep pollinators out as well. So you have to really be creative on how to meet some of that goals, whether it means switching up your seed or um, planting a pollinator garden right next to it like we've done. There's just some options and some things you gotta be aware of. Uh, kind of a past, how and why did Wild Race SCD get one? So in 2010, uh, NICS came up with a I think it was an RCPP back then. It was kind of one of those new rollout things where we're gonna do this whole high tunnel thing. Well, nobody really knew what it was. Um, luckily, we had a DC in our office that was really progressive and pushed the district to say, hey, you know, I think this is something you guys should look into. Uh, so 2012, uh, we collaborated, got an agreement going, and I think that thing went up about that year. Uh, and it yielded a lot of positive results. I think three or four apps got funded right after that got up and people could see it and understand what it was. I mean, people generally are a little bit more timid if you don't understand something. Um, so it was nice, a nice uh, segue to get people to be comfortable with it. Um, just remember, <laughs> people ask me, well, what was it like setting up? And I was like, no, nah, I don't remember. I don't think I was around for that. Son of a biscuit. Photo <laughs> evidence <laughs> always, always tells a different story. Um, I was helping, yeah, this is putting the wiggle wire up on here. So basically, this is a plastic sheet, and you just wiggle a piece of wire into this little guide thing on the top and the bottom, and that's how the signs roll up. So sometimes you can't plead ignorance when there's a photo to prove otherwise. Um, so, what have we been up to? from the past into the present now. Um, so I believe it was Holly, Mavi, and Keith Knudsen out of DCB contacted us. He said, hey, we're really looking at getting out and meeting with some people on high tunnels and doing an advanced workshop to really educate these guys on some of these practices. So we, we held a workshop, and I think we had probably 10 for that workshop. Um, Kind of just kept that relationship going. I was really happy with how it turned out. Um, so then they contacted us again in 2019 and said, hey, you know, we're looking at working with NRCS. You know, we feel like there is still more work that can be done for urban agriculture and more technical assistance that can be provided to these high tunnel guys. Uh, would you be interested in helping? So they reached out to both uh, Wild Rice and Burley County and the Minokan Farm. And we said, I think everyone was pretty amicable to it. Yeah, we'd be interested in that. Um, fast forward to the fall of 19, and we found out that everything was funded and approved. So we were on board for creating this whole collaboration. So what, what was this grant? Um, basically, the first step was working with uh, the local people like Burley County, Wild Rice, uh, Dakota College, really putting together some of those local contact names. 
and getting those to those guys and they just called out and talked to the producers said hey what what have you liked since you got these what haven't you liked and where do you think we can do more and kind of the one flagging thing that kind of kept coming up was just well i want more training more knowledge more technical assistance which is cool that's what we're here for you know so many times you know people want money but some it's really cool when they just want expertise so step three we kind of took each individual area uh, dakota college minokin and the wild rice and kind of tried to figure out what practices fit best for each location and then we work towards implementing those and performing some outreach and field days. So here was our, well, so obviously 2020 hit and nobody really quite knew what to do as far as field days. I think, I think Minokin still did theirs. I'm not sure if uh, Dakota College did theirs. I did basically just a general write up in our newspaper explaining our story. Um, to kind of work on just at least furthering the knowledge of what we were doing. So here we are meeting outside. Outside, we were, we were doing good. I mean, it might be close on six feet, but by golly, we're outside. So where are we going? So we still got one year left on this grant, so we're doing some cool practices that I'll touch on after this, but uh, a really unique opportunity kind of came up uh, I always skim, skim through the emails that NRCS sends out and they were looking for a request for projects and I was looking through the funding pools and I noticed, God, this doesn't seem right. There's no funding for, there's no local funding pool for high tunnels, which there has been in the past several years. Um, so now I kind of beat around the idea and I was like, well, I'm just going to put together an idea and I'm going to shoot it out to the group and see what they say. So I put together a proposal and kind of send it out to our group. And then luckily Jaden was on the group and he goes, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. I think Morton County's doing something very similar to this. So um, we kind of took a look and yeah, Val uh, Froelich out of Morton County was putting up something very similar. So and within two weeks, we kind of took both proposals and kind of just kind of pushed everything together and put it together and put submitted a proposal for $60,000 be available for equip for high tunnels in North Dakota. Um, with priorities coming in areas where we had existing places. Um, and I, we actually got that approved just a simple goal of putting more high tunnels on the landscape. Um, batching deadline was March 4th with contracts pre-approved on April 8th. 8th. I, the last I heard in talking with our local DC, there was $100,000 worth of apps in there. So I felt bad because we started running the numbers on 80,000 and we were like, God, I don't know if we can do that many high tunnels, but um, just goes to show you that you, you should always think, think big. Um, so that's kind of where we're going with that. It's kind of cool to see that whole thing carry through into more stuff hitting the ground. Um, now I'm going to focus some more on just those practices that we're implementing within our high tunnel. Uh, the big ones for us, cover crops, IPM, crop rotation, and micro irrigation. Cover crop 340, definition by the NRCS book, grasses, legumes, and forms planted for seasonal vegetative cover. You know, I'm coming from a 319 background. I'm familiar with them. Yeah, we put those on PP acres or following greens all the time. Let's put some turnips and radishes out there. Um, reduce the compaction, that's a huge problem in our area. Soil health, and then salinity. Like I said, common things we use, radish, turnip, dry. So this is kind of that whole field thought process of what cover crops should look like. So here's what cover crops look like in a high tunnel. A little bit different, right? So how we got there was basically following those soil health principles. Um, soil armor, minimizing soil disturbance, plant 
diversity and continual life plant root and livestock integration, the five principles. So as I, I kind of took a inventory, kind of very similar to what these guys were talking about, that aha moment. I started thinking about, well, you know, what should we be doing on our, our high tunnel as we're getting proposed? Well, what practices do you guys want to do? So looking at it, it's like, well, soil armor, well, every fall we pull everything and close the sides prior to freeze out because we, uh, obviously disease is always uh, one thing that pushes people pretty hard um, in the high tunnels. Minimizing soil disturbance, well, it get, gets killed every spring prior to planting. Plant diversity, that's the one thing that we're doing a pretty good job of. I mean, we generally track it, so um, you're rotating those crops around because if you don't, uh, the aphids will let you know that you're not doing that, and you'll end up with a lot of issues. Um, continual live plant root. Uh, We've got on the side, we've got a strawberry bed, not basically the only perennial vegetation that was out there. And livestock integration, we didn't have any livestock out there. So, cover crops to the rescue. Soil armor. So basically the goal of our cover crops for our high tunnel is, is I do not like that the sun just bakes into our high tunnel all winter long without anything out there. That's just, ugh, not good. Minimizing soil disturbance. So my thought process on what we're looking at doing this spring is basically no tilling our pepper plants directly into the drip tape line next spring. So basically I've got a really cool flame weeder that I can go right along where the, the row is supposed to go and I can torch it and I can just pop those in there that way I'll have a continual living root. And livestock integration, could probably do something, but I'm, I'm just not quite there yet. So we're gonna go with four out of five right now. <laughs> but what to plant? You know, so this is kind of that, kind of that question. What do, what do I do that meets those goals? Um, it needs to survive cold temperatures. I mean, it dips down, it's, thankfully it, it it's, very seldom gets much below 30 in that high tunnel as long as everything's closed up. Uh, the cloudier days, it causes issues, but a uh, day like today, I bet you it's probably 85 in there. Um, needs to handle low or no, no moisture. Um, you know, we're basically, we water that thing off of our, our building, and if you have the water hooked up too early or too late, the water line breaks and you flood the office. Trust me, I know. Um, it needs to be able to handle salinity. We got a lot of, we got a lot of problems with salinity in there, um, just from mismanagement over the years. Um, obviously highly compacted areas. Uh, we got that walkway through there that is just more of an, a, a waste area than anything, unfortunately. Um, but as well as just the repetitive tillage. I mean, it, that thing's got a hard pan already. Um, it would be ideal if the species that we use could be done either seeded or broadcast seeded because that way you get a little more flexibility. And for me, as I look at this, um, you know, you talk about farmers and producers and they say, well, on the smaller operations, you know, these 40, 50 acres, you know, like, like Dan Morgan said, he's like, they're making those profitable and they're expanding. High tunnel people are the same way. Um, you give them a high tunnel, and they'll start marketing some stuff and getting it going. Um, but, you know, for them, it's got to also be, you know, something that ties into their business as well. So I did some research. Spinach kept popping up as something that does pretty well handling salinity, uh, handles cool temperatures. So we went ahead and tried it. Year one, what did we learn? So I did spinach and I did a, a, a mix of lettuce. So spinach will overwinter in the high tunnel without any water. Um, it, do, it will become very sweet. It's kind of a really, kind of a weird mind trick. Uh, you put that spinach leaf into your mouth after it's been without water for about two months and it tastes like you're eating a leafy sweet pea. I mean, it is just nothing but sweet sugars coming through. Um, actually, in some places, there's a market for sweet spinach, I found out. 
Um, manually pulled the spinner trips. I just wanted to see, you know, you always want to see what's above. I was like, guy, I want to see what's below. Um, those trips were over five inches long on some of that stuff that it overwintered. Um, and it did, it established by broadcasting or seeding. It seemed like the little stuff did a little bit better. If that had a lot of leaf mass to it, it didn't quite do as well. That and to kill it, it took multiple attempts with the flame leader to terminate. Um, here's a picture of those roots, like I said, uh, very long. So if you think about what that was out there, that's a heck of a lot of, of tillage we're doing without putting anything in there. So here's what it looked like before. And anything they say online for like, killing things with the flame reader that are just supposed to just crisp it just a little bit so it wilts and it dies down on its own. Well, the spinach was so thick that just we weren't even hitting half of it. So it took multiple attempts to get it down. Here's, I, I was a little bit more deliberate the second time. Uh, pretty well toasted it. And you can see there's still a bit of residue out there. Uh, so year two is where we're at this year. Um, and we're kind of at the point now where we're basically planning our field operation for the summer on how we want to do our cover crops in the winter. So, you know, you talk about that switch in thought process. We're basically now farming our high tunnel for our cover crops instead of, you know, figuring out how to put our cover crops in there. Um, we did expand the species this year. Um, Kind of, we kind of brainstormed with some folks about some possibilities of including. And we came up with kale, arugula, uh, a different variety of spinach and lettuce, and then also Swiss chard. Um, the idea also of flame weeding those lines for drip tape, and like I said, no chilling those pepper plants right in there. Um, through this grant, we were able to get some equipment as well. Uh, that we had a two row cedar that was, I think, a jang. And then there's a basically a six row cedar. Um, the six row cedar worked really well. The, the two row cedar basically was about this long and the cedar was back about this far. So if you're familiar with high tunnels, you, you gotta kinda go all the way, but you're tired. So we were wasting just a bunch of area with that one. Um, so that was unfortunate. Uh, that's the nice thing about doing research is that you can then carry on that information to producers. So also, one of the more challenges is how to water, you know, we're used to drip tape where you just basically have this little line of vegetation. Um, I devoted, it was about 40 square feet to cover crops. So we did switch to a sprinkler system in there in the fall just to accommodate watering that much. Here's cover crops from this year. As you can see, this is becoming a bigger and bigger chunk of our high tunnel, which is really starting to freak out our high tunnel technician, but uh, that's fine too. Um, as you can see over here, this is our spin. Oh, oh geez. This over here is spinach. You get into here and you get into the kale and that actually is, is still standing. It's just really, really, really pale green. Um, the arugula is all of this. Um, get into the lettuce here, the spinach, and then this is more lettuce again. So I'll ask the group, what, which cover crops do you think are working out there and which ones do you think aren't? They're all working. Oh. Good answer, because I'm impressed, because the spinach is still growing. The arugula, as much as I hate the taste of it, <laughs> is really doing well at, you know, giving us that residue and that ground cover. Um, the lettuce and the Swiss chard will be interesting to see how those all recover. Um, but yeah, they're all doing the exact job. I just didn't want the sun beating down on that soil. So you have to always remember, what is the goal of what you're doing? And no matter if it's pretty or not, as long as you're meeting that goal, you, you're winning. So where are we going next year? So this basically, we're working now on the plan 
So we've kind of come up with our layout for this here. And the big thing is, is we're rotating this cover crop around. So with what we finished up last year, we pretty well cover crop one whole entire side of that high tunnel. So the goal is, is yeah, by, well, I haven't even said what year four is from, right? But, so year three, we're kind of trying to get through that next half. Um, so one thing that kind of, as we held meetings and we really had in it, uh, I really kind of put it onto the group. I asked people, what stuff do you think we should also have in there? And the big thing that kind of came through is, yeah, you've got all this stuff above ground, but you really have nothing going below ground. Um, so we're gonna try some stuff this upcoming year. Um, so basically now we're pairing a root crop with each leafy green. We're adding carrots, parsnips, radishes, uh, red kale, and then romaine lettuce is another one that apparently does very well in cold temperatures. And then I kind of came up with my own coin for this methodology. So whenever I make supper for my kids and I ask them how it is, they give me one of these. And I started thinking, I'm like, that's exactly what I'm doing with my cover crops. One down, one up. So we're gonna do paired, paired rows uh, with that on all of those rows. And then what we'll also do is then seed in between the rows as well, because what we basically are shooting for is a solid mat. Um, any questions on cover crops? Before we move into that, yeah. Jake. What, what percent ground cover are you trying to achieve with the cover crop? Honestly, I would say 100% as long as I can. Have you, do you have that? On the arugula, I would say we do. The kale's a little wispy. I mean, it depends on how long you can, how big you can get that spinach to. Um, when did you seed it? So most of that is seeded around that mid-August. So it's not a bad turnaround for being so did you have a regular late. crop there and then you came in and seeded that? Yeah, so basically I'm planting like some of our shorter stuff, like our peas, our beans, that stuff that kind of comes in, you get that huge production and then you got, got to take it out because it just gives up after so long. So it's basically, yeah, that's where the whole planning process gets into there of, you know, what are you going to put in there? That's another one that we're going to put in there. We've actually, short of, we've got the bigger radishes but then we also have some smaller radishes that will be done in that time as well so there again it's it's kind of a, a dual crop system but with covers yeah i was gonna say could you come back with your peas later and just grow your peas as late as you could too though the problem really, is, is really that stupid. so monogan has actually addressed the problem with the peas so the problem is is what when you get so much sunlight some of that stuff gets hard and peas is one of them that really gets hit hard when you get into like the dog days of summer when it's mm -hmm. there's just nothing you can do to get it to be under 100 degrees in there they, you can put a shade on the whole high tunnel to keep that heat down but that's that's the best option for it but i was just saying in the fall you could do peas too right yeah when that could be part of your cover crop, it might not overwinter, but I'm just saying you'd leave residue. So and you'd have that food crop still. True. I mean, that, like, there's a lot of, you know, garden stuff that you could come back with again later. Yeah, but, 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 but part of the issue with that is that, uh, and, and I think in the right situation, anything can be a cover, but part of the issue is you're using a crop, you know, the cover crop that you're also going to use in your crop production. And so there's, there's a good opportunity with cover crops to give yourself what you don't have. Yes. And, and that, you know, a good place to start is what don't I have? And typically what every garden doesn't have is the full season rates. And, and, and what builds soil aggregates is a full season rate. And so there's, a, there's kind of an opportunity there to bring it. All of these are great, but if you can get a grass in them yet, then you, then you get the best of both worlds and start building them. Yeah. I have anything that doesn't have ground cover on it, I'll, I'll get the salt. Yeah. You know, because now you're farming in the tropics. Yeah. You have high water, so 
a lot of water that's going to go and we can move it through a plant, then transpiration won't hurt you a bit, just build aggregates, and it'll sequester carbon. And that's the one I've been stumped on as a cool season grass that I can eat. Well, most, most monoculture people um, <laughs> usually if you have a room then you're going after the grass now. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, so we, so I would let the room then eat yeah. the grass and then you eat the room. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. Yeah. Another thing I had is with your torch, your flame weeder. Yep. Um, do you do that in between the rows and everything like that too, or are you just doing it on your plant? It depends on. So actually, the cover crop that I flame weeded, it's weird because I'm trying to think of what year I'm in. So the ones that are pictured there, we actually had that be a row. So ours is basically a giant PVC line. So I just moved it, I moved it to off center of the rows. So my cover crop was actually off centered off of my rows when I did that patch. Um, so is it like a torch? Is that what it is? Yeah, it's basically like a birth of torch. Yep. So the thing I was wondering is, does it affect your soil, your biology that was in the soil or anything like that, or not? I, if, you know, I mean, that's what I was kind of wondering. It, 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 does, it doesn't heat it up too much or anything? Hard enough. No, I don't know. It's just another thing I thought. That's what I was thinking about right now. The, the problem is, is uh, as you can see, our rows are pretty tight in there. <laughs> You gotta be careful with where you're pointing that torch when you're because it does not take long to torch a tomato plant. Uh, Alright. We'll move into the IPM section. Um, so pest management 595 by NRCS. How did I make our IPM? Well, similar, and I got kind of stole some of my thunder, but so yeah, the biggest thing is ID, what pests do I have out there, and group it. Because if you need to know kind of what lines you're going with and what you need to work on. The second step is, yeah, evaluate your control options and what your threshold is, because yeah, you can, you can do some damage to other things trying to fix this thing that just doesn't even really matter. <laughs> if you're not paying attention. Then implementation and evaluation, you know, did it, did what I do work? So, kind of some past ID. Why is it important? Well, because if you look over here and all you see is this, holy smokes, you got aphid problems up the wazoo. <laughs> but, if you're paying attention, always check the undersides, always look at everything because if you have these little guys working for you, you know what those are? Go ahead. Oh. Yeah, I can't. Ladybug. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And they love aphids. Yeah, they do. Um, so, you know, it's you have to monitor, hey, is this negatively impacting the production on this plant? Or is it going to balance itself out? Oh, he, he touched on it over in there, too. There ain't nothing that bothers me more than cabbage beetles. Um, and, and that's also a big culture thing. You just got to be paying attention to those little buggers because, like, like he said, I'll take every one of those, I'll put it down in the cushion. <laughs> but then you have to know, hey, is this, what about this little guy? Yeah, it's just a butterfly. He's okay. So control methods. Many different types of control methods that you can use to take care of your IPM stuff. Um, mechanical slash physical. Um, we've gone as far as just removing the plants out of a high tunnel if it's highly infected. Um, chemical, we've used chemicals, biologicals, cultural, and for me, cultural is the biggest one. Um, I noticed when I started tracking our crop rotation and really focusing in on that is when we stopped having the big flushes. Um, factors that can affect you control methods, non-target species. Hey, is what I'm gonna do out there to control this pest gonna hurt a lot of other things? And if so, how can I liquidate some of those? Like for us, you're gonna spray, make sure it's late at night when it's cool, we can put those high tunnel sides down, 
and we don't have butterflies coming in and picking up insecticide and leaving. Um, will it affect the pollination of crops? Is there a chemical carryover? And if so, how long until I can eat that fruit? And you know what? We live in, anyone can walk into there. It's automated sides, so on a hot day, they just sneak in there. Um, you know, but then for people who are producers, they gotta think, hey, I, this is my livelihood. I need, these tomatoes have to get to the market for me to make my money. So is that gonna impact, can I, can I withstand that last little bit of disease in order to get my cash crop? Cost effectiveness. Um, I used two different chemicals. Uh, one of them was, was cheap and it did nothing for control. And one of them was $300 for a bottle and it did great. So sometimes you pay for what you get and then just what your overall production goals are. And then, like I said, implementation and evaluation. So many people do it, and then they don't think, okay, well, did it work or did it not? Uh, did it control the pest, and for how long? That's the biggest thing. Sometimes you, just, you don't need to control it for the rest of the year, you just gotta get through one point. Did it negatively impact our production? Is there another option that may have worked better that would have had a better result? So, some of the stuff implemented. Crop rotation, caps lock, bold, underline. Just like in production, it's good for high tones too. Um, micro irrigation and drip tape is a great one. Uh, that way you just, if you don't have water, it just burns up in there. Uh, I know a lot of people flood irrigate. Um, we end up with a lot more weeds. Uh, we've used weed barrier fabric along the outside. We have quack grass that came into our high tunnel from the outside. So we basically snuffed out everything for six feet on the side of it. Some of the pesticides, diatomaceous earth, hyganic, exazagard, glyphosate, tempo. Diatomaceous earth is a fun one. Are you guys familiar with what that is? Yeah. So you can sit over there where the, the cow, cabbage mods are and you can dump that thing right over the top of them and make some jerky out of them. So for you guys that don't know, diatomaceous earth is a really, it's basically dried seashells. So as you dump it onto an invertebrate, it gets into their wet, soft skin and it just starts sucking them up. Funny story, it also dries out people's mouths when they just think, oh, I'll just grab that right off the plant and eat it. One of our supervisors thought that he would grab a cucumber from the road. He was pretty thirsty by the time he got home. I did put a sign out there that said that we were doing stuff, but. So, uh, cover crops. You know, basically trying to have that good mat of cover to make sure, you know, you're out producing the weeds. Thinning. Basically, anything that is too thick, you can thin. Flame slash manual weeding, hunting and trapping. Rabbits know how to burrow under stuff and get into high tunnels. They're crafty little creatures. So here's a, a, a really cool picture on thinning. This was carrots that were not thin, carrots that were thin. That's the problem with really fine seed. Um, they've done. Some companies are doing uh, tape now for some of that stuff to kind of control some of that seed. Um, but it just goes to show the difference that you can have um, between two things. Here's that weed barrier fabric that I was talking about. There's the uh, drip tape, those two chemicals that we're using. Now, the big thing about these ones, why I picked these two, I was really looking for ones that basically I could apply 24 hour reentry period and you can eat the next day. I mean, that's basically was the big things that I was pushing for and did some research on them. I think Minnesota, University of Minnesota had some. These are two that kind of popped to the top of that list. Huge thank you to Wild Rice Soil Conservation District, especially Leslie, all the work she does and puts up with. Uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, DEQ, Dakota College at Botnell, Burley County SCD, Morton County SCD, working together 
uh, both on the, the project uh, for the demonstration stuff as well as the grant project. It was really a cool, great opportunity to work together with those folks on that stuff. So um, yeah, just never ever would have imagined when I graduated college with a uh, degree in wildlife management that I would be producing on this or giving a presentation on this, but here I am and still trying new stuff. So um, without any questions. Cool. Yeah, um, so did you have that aphid problem in the high tunnel? Not this last year. I didn't I didn't do anything for aphids this okay. last year. And and we drastically reduced the amount of cabbage family stuff that we had in the high tunnel because we had cabbages, we had Brussels sprouts, we had kale. And I started doing a family taxonomy and I'm like, oh there's no no course. We had, we had it year round. So it was just a breeding ground for those. So that's where like planning out those, those practices was really helped. I was wondering if you had released any ladybugs or anything in the high tunnel for. Nope. Ever tried that or anything? Nope. No. Okay, man. Have you used any kind of fertilizer? We put oh, like compost. Yeah, there? we put a whole load of compost in there. 2019. So we'll probably do again for another slug. Um, one of the things I'm looking at maybe trying this year is malorganite. Gotcha. Um, the problem with the compost was is that we're ju it's just a little too small, so we can't quite get the bobcat in there. Um, but that's what we did the first time was we basically got a load of compost from a local producer and put in there. Um, he doesn't do compost anymore. He does man more of like the dried manure. So that makes me a little nervous because it's not going through that full process of breaking down. So in a high tunnel, any seed that's in there that's viable is gonna grow. So uh, I was trying to source uh, some more organic matter as well, but shipping is brutal these days as well. And we got a composter now. And we did, we actually purchased it through that grant, uh, a new composter as well. So um, working towards being better in the future. You grow flowers now? We do. That's our Usually every, every row has just about a flower at the beginning of it. Uh, a lot of them are marigolds. Uh, it does help with the bugs. I do remember before he started doing that, being in there and you you, <laughs> you couldn't even stand in there with the no mosquitoes in there. So uh, yeah, we, we incorporate some marigolds. So there's some, peonies. Got some peonies, some sunflowers, I think. There's roses. Yep. I haven't done any like production flowers, but more just an ornamental here and there for pollination to kind of draw those in. You can get multiple colors and it brings in your pollen. Yeah. Zinnias will go to the ceiling. I don't know if I want that. I'm just saying. And you just can't, you can't eat them. Um, it's a tough one for me. The, the, the giant, the giant zillows go, and then balsams will be just multi-colored, so you get a lot. Of oh, so you kill a lot of birds with one stone by that color. So balsams work it that way. With zinnias, if you if you need ceiling support. <laughs> Hold up the high tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Indeterminate. Those, two. Those will get to see what But I will tell you, the nice opportunity is when you messed up that work and you know it and you're hearing it from your wife, you can always go out and pick a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and we do have, we actually have a pollinator, an NDSU pollinator garden right next to it. So that really helps with some of that, with that pollinating as well. Um, any other questions? All right.